how did you learn how to pray? When I was a kid, I learned how to pray kind of in this manner. In the criminal justice system, the people are represented by two separate yet equally important groups, the police who investigate crime and the district attorneys who prosecute the offenders. These are their stories. Okay, that's not exactly how I learned how to pray, but it's very close. See, I, we were taught as children some memorized, almost liturgical prayers. Before we ate dinner, we would pray together as a family. God is great. God is good. Let us thank Him for our food. By His hands, we are fed. Thank you, Lord, for daily bread. Uh, before we went to bed, we would pray, Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. And then we would have a list of family members and friends that we would pray for. I learned in a formal, memorized, as I said, kind of liturgical manner. Now, memorization is great because it helps us learn and it, it helps us kind of lay some foundation. But I don't think God has called us to pray in this kind of liturgical, formal format all the time. We've come to the portion of the Sermon on the Mount that we refer to as the Lord's Prayer. It is the greatest prayer that has ever been uttered. It shows up here in Matthew chapter 6, and then it shows up again in a slightly shorter form in Luke chapter 11. And so the question that we have is, why are there two prayers, or why is it given to us twice? The Sermon on the Mount takes place early in Jesus' ministry, or at least early in Matthew's account of Jesus' ministry, and then, of course, Luke chapter 11 takes place almost at the end of Jesus' ministry. In chapter 9, he has set his face towards Jerusalem. He is on his way to be offered as a sacrifice. And so this prayer, in many ways, is kind of like bookends to his public ministry. You'll remember I've said that I believe that the Sermon on the Mount is a message that Jesus preached as he went from city to city, talking about what life was like living in the kingdom. And so that's one of the reasons why Matthew has such great detail for the sermon. He has heard it probably over and over and over again. And then towards the end of his ministry, just before he is going to be sacrificed, the disciples came to him in Luke 11. They said, Master, teach us how to pray like John's disciples have been taught to pray. Think about that for a moment. These were good Jewish men. They had been praying since they were children. They had been raised in the synagogue. They had heard others praying. The, the, the Pharisees, they probably heard the Sadducees. Their parents had prayed. They knew what prayer was, but there was something in their heart that made them realize that their prayer life was lacking. I did a survey a couple years ago around this subject of prayer. And I asked, I said, what is the one thing that you would like to hear in a class, in, in, in a training session? What is one thing that you would like to know about prayer? And the overwhelming response in a church where people had been in church for generations, they had been saved, many of them for decades. They had taught Sunday school. They had heard preaching. They had prayed themselves. The number one thing that came back, teach us how to pray. Jesus says, here is how you pray. The disciples ask, how do we pray? The passage that we're going to look at this morning is a primer on prayer. So what I want to do is go to God's Word and take what Jesus says and consider the subject of prayer 101. Prayer 101. We're in Matthew chapter 6. We're going to begin in verse 7 and read down to verse 15. The Word of God says, And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then like this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive our debts as we also forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. May God add his blessing to the reading of this portion of his word. By watching Jesus, the disciples knew that their prayer life was to be different. By watching Jesus, they realized that his heart and his approach to prayer was very different than their own. They understood, for example, that that prayer was to be priority. It's a beautiful picture that we have in the Gospels. Jesus prays every day before everybody gets up. He, He gets alone by himself and he commits substantial time to praying and speaking to the Father. You look at the book of Luke. Prayer precedes just about every single major event, major decision in the life of Christ. Prayer was not just to be priority. Prayer was to be a passion. Jesus desired to pray. For him, it was not obligation. It was opportunity. And the picture that he gave to the disciples is that prayer is not religion. It's a relationship. Now, as we read the Gospels and we we come to Luke chapter 11, when we consider what Jesus says here in in Matthew chapter 6, there is one place where I think we find common ground with the disciples. Don't be offended by this, but we have a real connection with the disciples in our ignorance. We don't know everything. They didn't know everything. Being with Jesus made them realize there was more to life. There was more to faith than they had been used to. If we will humble ourselves and we will admit that we do not know everything, that we have shortcomings in our lives, we will put ourselves in a position where Jesus can really do something with our life. I am grateful for Dr. Ken Hemphill. Dr. Hemphill several years ago wrote a resource, a study called the prayer of Jesus. And in that study, he looks at this passage in Matthew and the passage in Luke. And several of the ideas in this message have been shaped by the study that I did in that book a couple of years ago, led our Wednesday night class through that book a couple of years ago. And so I'm thankful to him because his ideas have kind of helped shape my understanding of this passage and what Jesus is trying to communicate in these words. So here's the idea I want to give you today. Knowing what prayer is helps us understand how prayer is to be conducted. Knowing what prayer is helps us understand how to pray. So this morning we're going to try to answer the question, how do I pray? How do I pray in such a way that enriches and glorifies the Lord and builds my life up? So the first thing I want you to see, prayer is a life focused upon the Lord. The language that Jesus uses in verse 9 points to three vital truths. There's a truth on intimacy, there's a truth on community, and there's a truth regarding God's sovereignty. Let's look at the second word first. It's the word Father. Jesus is not being irreverent when he uses the term Father. It was something that was was revealed to us in the Old Testament. It's used a lot more of God in the New Testament. It's a word of intimacy. It points to the nature of the relationship that we have with God. As I said a few moments ago, we're not called to a religion. We're called to a relationship. That's why the Bible says that in Christ we have this salvation. As a part of that salvation, we are adopted into the family of God through the blood of Jesus. We are joint heirs with Christ. We are a part of the family, and God relates to us as God, as King, as Lord, as lawgiver, as sovereign, but as Father. He's a king who's a father. He is the Lord who is a father. It's a statement of love. It's a statement of responsibility on his part. We pray in intimacy and we pray in community. Let's look at verse 9 again. 
the very first word in the prayer, our, our Father. When you look at the verses between 9 and 13 as Jesus is, is walking through this prayer with us, you will notice that all of the first person pronouns are plural. Our Father, our daily bread, forgive us our debts, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Why are all of the, the pronouns plural in this passage? Well, prayer should always remind us that we are part of a larger community, that we are a part of the family of God, and that when we pray, we should pray for fellow believers. In other words, when I begin to pray, I realize that your needs are my opportunities to intercede, that your needs are my opportunities to minister the love and the grace that God has, has bestowed upon me and to minister it into your life. The next phrase that he uses in this passage is in heaven, our Father in heaven. It's not a statement simply of location, but what it does is it focuses our attention upon his ability to know and to care. It's a statement regarding his sovereignty. Let me just say this. The great battle for us in prayer oftentimes is the battle of perspective. Let's be honest. Prayer can be one of the most selfish activities that we participate in. Prayer can be all about me, my needs, my desire, and not about anybody else. Years ago, Disney put out a movie, you'll probably remember the movie, Finding Nemo. Wonderful movie, fun movie, good family movie. I uh, saw it once or twice. There is a theme that kind of runs through, kind of a running gag that runs through the movie that the first time I saw it, I thought, wow, that is genius, that is brilliant. It's the seagulls. You'll remember when the seagulls are, are, are in the scene, all you hear from them is mine, 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 mine. I got to think about it after that. Go out to the beach with, with a piece of bread, a cookie or something like that and, and toss it down and watch those seagulls just flock in there. And they are some of the most selfish beings that they are. They run in there, they dart, they knock each other around just to grab hold of what they want for themselves. I wonder if sometimes our prayer life isn't just like that. Mine, 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 me, me, me. When God looks down and he sees his flock and he sees us as, as sheep, as a part of that flock, I wonder if the sound that he hears is not bah, 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 but rather mine, 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 like those Disney gulls. So let me encourage you to do this. Consciously, actively think about this. When you begin to pray, Pray for others as much as you pray for yourself. Sit down and, and, and write out your prayers. Lord, I three things in my life that I really need your attention for right now. Four things that I, I want to see you, I need to see you move or, or to provide or produce within my life. And then turn right around and write out the same number of things for other people as well. You say, well, I really don't know what other people's needs are. Well, you need to. You really need to. You need to be close with folks growing in their life, them growing in your life so that you know what their needs are so that you know how to pray for them, how to encourage them. Spend an equal amount of time praying for them as you do for yourself. Matter of fact, part two of this, pray for them before you pray for yourself. I found sometimes when I pray for what's going on in someone else's life and I realize the struggle that they're going through, I realize the need that they have in their life, it makes my needs look a little bit smaller. And in that is a blessing from God. It's about perspective. So prayer is a life focused upon the Lord. Second thing I want you to see, prayer is a life committed to the Lord. Three things he says at the end of verse 9 and end of verse 10. Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done. Now when we look at those three, I want you to understand that these are best understood as personal commitments on our part. In other words, we commit to hallow the name of God. We commit 
to be involved in bringing forth God's kingdom. We commit to doing the will of God in our life. So let's look at those three real quickly. Hallowed be your name. What exactly does that mean? That's one of those very religious statements, one of those very religious phrases, but there's a lot of meat in that phrase. Hallowed literally means to make holy or to treat as holy. Remember, at this very moment, in the throne room of glory, God is seated on his throne. And the picture that we have in scripture is that there is a, an army of angels circling around that throne room, crying out, holy, holy, holy. They are hallowing the name of the Lord. Now let me tell you a little bit about my family. My family's not perfect, not by any stretch of the imagination. There's never been a time when my father or, or my grandfather sat me down in a chair and said, uh, you know, being a Dixon is this grave responsibility, son. Um, our name carries with it much prestige. Uh, our name carries with it this great legacy of honor. I mean, we're not bad people, but those times of conversations don't take place in our family. But it is the desire of my heart to leave the reputation of my family better than I found it. And again, not to say that we have a bad reputation, but I hope and pray that I have lived in such a way and that I have made an impact in people's lives and that I have enough integrity that when people hear of our family, they hear of it as a positive. And my sincere prayer is that my two sons will take our family name and they will live it with honor and with dignity and they will elevate it in their life even more. Think about what is a name? It is that summation of our character and of our reputation. If you go to my library, for example, and, and, and you look through some of the commentaries, and you pull out a commentary from John MacArthur, John Stott, um, F.F. Bruce, I trust their scholarship. I've read enough of their works, and, and, and I understand their approach to Scripture, and, and, and we have a similar understanding of what the Word of God is. And so I begin to read their words. I have a level of trust and what they're going to say. Unfortunately, there's some other Bible teachers that don't have the same understanding of the Word of God. They don't have the same understanding of what inspiration is. And, and so when I read a quote from one of them, when, when, when I have one of their books or I look through their books, everything I read about them or read from them, I read with a level of skepticism. God is very particular in the care for his name. He holds his own name in high estimation. Ezekiel rebuked Israel for their unrighteous behavior because they were sullying the name of God. Ezekiel 36 verse 23 says, I will vindicate the holiness of my great name which has been profaned among the nations and which you have profaned among them. And the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God. When through you I vindicate my holiness before their eyes. As believers, we are to hold high the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Second thing in that passage is the statement, your kingdom come. That's the longing of believers. What is the kingdom of God? It's his rule over his creation. It's his rule in the life of his people the exercise of his authority over his subjects. So there are a couple questions that come from that. Is God's kingdom here or are we waiting for it? Well, the answer to that is both. Currently, it is here. God is sovereign God. He reigns and he rules over every inch of this universe. He created all things and he is in control and he is in authority over all of it at this moment. He operates from heaven directing the affairs of the church, directing the affairs of our countries, directing the affairs of this creation. But yet there's also this element of his kingdom that we anticipate, that we look forward to, that we long for. Right now, in many ways, you could say God's reign and rule is in secret. That the, the, the world is, is also being run by kings and kingdoms, presidents and countries and such. 
They don't thwart the plans of God. God is able to work around them. God is able to work through them without them knowing it. But there is an element of God's kingdom that it will be realized in its fullness at the second coming of Jesus when he establishes at that point his visible kingdom in the world. The last element in this second point, Jesus prays, your will be done. Your will be done be done one certainty regarding God's will it's not convenient it's not convenient but it requires commitment it requires obedience God's will in my life demands prayer my flesh wants my will my flesh wants my desire and for me to submit myself to the plans and to the will of God it requires a vital prayer life where I'm spending time with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords letting him shape my heart so let me ask you a question how is God's will being executed in your life right now as you look at your calendar as you look at your checkbook how is God's will revealing itself in your life think back in the last week the last month what is one activity that you have participated in? What is one thing that you have done only because you know it's God's will for your life? If we're not careful when we pray, we will pray in such a way, as I said a moment ago, that is selfish. And we will pray in such a way that it's permissive. In other words, it's the idea that we are giving God permission in our life. Hallowed be your name. I give you permission to be different in my life. I give you permission to be holy in my life. Your kingdom come. Oh Lord, you really need me. You, you need me to help build your church. You need me to help expand your kingdom. Your will be done. Lord, I approve your plan for my life. It checks all the boxes that satisfies my desire will allow it to take place. The truth is our language should remind us of the awesome nature of God. God's name is holy because his very nature is holiness. God's kingdom will come whether I participate in advancing it or not. God will accomplish his will whether I participate in it or not he will do it with me or he will do it without me third thing prayer is a life focused upon the Lord committed to the Lord prayer is a life that is satisfied with the Lord I really believe the older I get the longer I walk with the Lord I really believe that this issue of satisfaction is the termite that destroys our faith and our witness so often we claim to love the Lord we claim to, to want the Lord in our life but the truth is we're just not satisfied with the Lord we want more we want something different we want something fresh and new instead of that long abiding relationship with him Jesus again points to daily bread he points to sin he points to temptation when he prays for our daily bread it helps us remember that we've got to abandon this notion that we have this secular life and we have this holy life, that we have that which is secular and that which is sacred. Daily bread and, and commitments to the Lord, they don't live in, in separate streets. They're, they're not two separate. They are mutually interdependent upon each other. And so the question for us is, how can an ordinary meal turn it to an opportunity for me to give glory to God. 1 Corinthians 10, 31 says, Whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. 1 Timothy 4, 4 says, For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving. So the Lord knows that you have a life. That life includes uh, cereal for breakfast. It includes diapers for babies, a, a coat for the wintertime, a roof over your head, a vehicle to get you back and forth to work. To most people, 
There is nothing spiritual about these needs. There's nothing spiritual about these items. But the believer understands and knows that these are all signs of God's compassion and His provision for us. That God meets our every single need. So when we pray God's daily bread, what we're doing is we are, we are being invited into worry-free living. I do not have to worry about my daily needs because the Lord is going to take care of those. Later on, we're going to move into the latter part of this chapter, but between verse 25 and verse 34 of, of Matthew chapter 6, six different times Jesus says, do not be anxious, do not worry, do not struggle with these kinds of of needs. So as we ask God for our daily bread, let me remind you of a couple of things. We are reminded that every meal we eat, we eat in His presence. And it's been provided by His hand. We are reminded that Jesus Himself is our daily bread. That Jesus Himself is the bread of life. And we learn to trust in his daily amount. Friend, I'll be honest with you. It does not matter what the Lord has ever provided me. I think there's always going to be that little flesh that says, a dollar was nice, two dollars would have been better. A Ford was nice, boy, a Lexus would be great. We need to trust in God's daily provision and in the amount that he gives to us. Jesus says we're praying for daily bread. We are praying to forgive our debtors and forgive our debtors. The believer who prays this line with sincerity, forgive us our debts as we forgive those who are indebted to us. The believer who prays that with sincerity is showing incredible spiritual maturity because we understand that sin creates an obligation. That when we have sinned against somebody, we are now obligated to them. And that when we're praying this, what we are doing is that we are asking God to forgive us for the obligation we have created, and we are forgiving the one who we believe has an obligation towards us. We understand that sin means we owe somebody something. And it's something we can never really pay back. And so the Lord has paid that on our behalf. We need to understand that as Jesus is teaching us how to pray in this passage, that when he says, give us our daily bread, it has the same weight and, and, and importance as when he says that we are to be praying for forgiveness and extending forgiveness. That we really can't go to the Lord and ask the Lord to provide for our daily needs if we are not walking around in a spirit of forgiveness and of grace. So what does it mean to forgive, or excuse me, what does it mean to confess sin? First thing, it means that we see sin in the same way that God does. We see it with the same um, venom. We see it with the same idea. We understand that it is damaging, that it is shameful, that it is corrupted, that it is blinding, and that we are rejecting that in our lives. The last thing he says is that we forgive our debtors. This doesn't mean that if we don't forgive someone, someone then, then we're not going to be forgiven. That, that, that extending forgiveness is a prerequisite for receiving forgiveness. What it means that we are to be forgiving in the same way that we received forgiveness. And that a forgiving heart is evidence, I believe, of true salvation. Matthew chapter 18, verse 21 through verse 35 tells the story of a servant who has forgiven this huge amount, this great debt. But he was a petty man. He didn't understand what grace was. And so he would not forgive someone else's minor debt. A true experience of grace makes us gracious towards others who have wronged us. It doesn't mean that we sit and we expect them to come and kneel and, and seek our forgiveness. Matter of fact, they may never seek forgiveness. They may never repent of their sin. But yet we are still to be ones who are forgiving them in the same way that we received forgiveness 
from the Lord. Don't you remember? Forgiveness is the divorce of obligation. Someone is obligated to you and you are divorcing them from that obligation. Why? Because that debt has already been paid. That debt is paid in the blood of Jesus Christ. So whether or not they ever ask me for forgiveness or whether they ever ask the Lord for forgiveness, whatever obligation I have because of their sin, that obligation has already been met in Jesus Christ. Forgiveness is an event. It's a moment in time when we go before the Lord and we absolve them, we forgive them. The church understands it's also a process. The greater the sin, the greater the pain. At times it may be the more difficult the process for us to really get to that place where we have this awareness in our spirit that we have forgiven them. Forgiveness is easy to receive. It's not always easy to extend. Jesus says, lead us not into temptation. It's not the idea that God is going to is going to tempt us. There's a there's a different actual word that's used here in the Greek that is used most of the time as we deal with the issue of, of temptation. The word that's used here really points more towards the idea of testing. The Bible tells us God doesn't tempt us, but he does test us. And what Jesus is saying here is that he does not want us to be tested and when tested give in to evil. That instead of seeing it as an out to be able to satisfy the flesh, that that test is a time when we can prove the faithfulness of God to carry us through to the other side. This is the greatest prayer that's ever been prayed. And I think there's great value in memorizing it and quoting it. But at the same time, it should serve for us as an outline, as a guide for our own prayer life. Let me say one more thing real quickly before I close. I said at the beginning, or I said a few moments ago, some statements about satisfaction. Prayer is an expression of satisfaction. Prayer is an expression of me being satisfied with God. And prayer is a statement that, Lord, I need you to satisfy what's going on in my life. When I need wisdom, I begin to pray because I know Jesus satisfies my ignorance. When I need resources, I know that he is the, he is the one who owns a cattle on a thousand hills. Jesus satisfies my needs. When I need forgiveness, I begin to pray because I know Jesus satisfies my spiritual longings. One of the reasons our prayer life is weak is that our hearts are not satisfied with Christ and we're seeking everything else but the provision of God and His Son Jesus to satisfy what we're longing for. Let me give you this word of encouragement. Jesus satisfies like nothing this world offers pray you have a blessed day. I pray that God's word is alive in your life, and I pray that you are committed to being a prayer warrior on behalf of the Lord. God bless.